Welcome to Empowered Learning. This is the second video in the video series for discussing Taylor and McLaurin uh, series or, or polynomials. So in this video, we are going to answer question number three. We're going to go into more detail with that uh, than we did in the first video. Okay. Um, if you're from unfamiliar with what those questions are that I'm talking about, um, please go back and look at the very first video on this series so that you can know what all six questions are so we can kind of follow along and know what's going on. For this video, we are going to uh, look at how do we know whenever we have a power series representation of a function that that power series is actually going to represent um, that function exactly. Okay. And for what x values is that going to happen? Well, we have two theorems that give us information on how to do that. Uh, the first one here is called the uh, Taylor remainder theorem. Okay? The second one is called the Taylor's inequality theorem. Okay? So this, this first theorem here gives us the conditions that we need to have in order for us to know that, yes, your power series represents um, your actual function that you were trying to you know, use that polynomial to represent it as uh, for a given set of x values. And in short, the Taylor series, sorry, the, the Taylor remainder theorem here um, essentially says this. Okay? If you are considering values of x that is within the interval of convergence for the power series that you're dealing with and if the limit as n approaches infinity of the remainder of your uh, Taylor series and again uh, just to make sure that we're clear if we had a, a function that would be represented as a Taylor series where the first n terms of the Taylor series is here and the n plus one ith term plus all the others that goes to infinity is going to be considered the remainder. If we looked at this portion here and the limit as it approaches infinity, if it goes to zero, provided that we choose x values within the interval of convergence to plug into there, um, we know that those two things will guarantee that our function f of x can be represented by um, the power series that we come up with it for. Um, again, as long as those values of x are within this interval of convergence. Okay. Now, the Taylor um, inequality theorem. What this does is, again, it looks at our function represented as a power series, and we break it up as a sum of the first n terms of the Taylor series plus the remainder. And one of the things that we know about the uh, remainder here is that the remainder, uh, each term in the remainder should look something like this, okay? And what I mean something like this, uh, I really more so mean is going to look something like this, okay? But if we're talking about the n plus one ith term, then it's going to look something more like this. Okay. And of course, if we're talking about the n plus two ith term, it's going to look something more like this. So the point that I'm trying to get here is that if the limit of your remainder here is going to zero, one of the properties that's going to um, be inherent about what that function r sub n of x is going to be like is that each term um, in the r sub n of x, meaning the n plus one of term, the n plus two of term, the n plus three of term of uh, that Taylor series, if we plug in the same x value into each of those terms, we should see that term getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, you know, for the higher values of n we go, okay? And of course, for the n plus one ith term, it just is going to look something like this, which mimics what I have here, where the c sub n plus one is just going to be some number divided by n plus one factorial, 
And of course that makes sense to us because we know C sub n should just be the nth derivative of our function evaluated at a divided by n factorial, okay? So that means when C is n plus one, I should have n plus one here, and this should be n plus one as well. And that's going to make this look like uh, some number divided by n plus one factorial, okay? And so for those of you that um, can't visualize what I just said there, I'll just go ahead and write it. So here um, we know that C sub n plus one should look something like F of n plus one evaluated at a divided by n plus one factorial, okay? And my whole point here is that this M looks like this nth plus one of derivative evaluated at a, this n plus one factorial looks like this n plus one factorial. And of course, um, here we see that we have the x minus a raised to the n plus one looks very similar to what we have here. Um, the absolute value is just there because we don't care whether that particular term is positive or negative. Okay, So this Taylor inequality theorem is basically saying, hey, if we're looking at our function being written as a power series, then here we can get an expression to help us be able to calculate error by look a, essentially looking at the first term of the r sub n of x or the n plus one if term. And we're saying that whatever value that is, um, the total error shouldn't be any more than what the value of this particular expression will be that I'm you know, erasing all the, the ink on right now, okay? So the most amount of error we should ever get um, if we have a function being approximated by a Taylor series for the first n terms of it should be whatever the value of the n plus one th term should be, that should be the largest error, okay? And so essentially what that does is it gives us an expression to use to be able to calculate the error so that um, we'll know how many terms of uh, how many, yeah, how many terms of the Taylor series we need in order to get to that level of accuracy of approximation um, of what the actual function is. And so it's an indirect way to essentially find out um, what n needs to be. Okay, so that we can um, list out the polynomial for the Taylor series uh, with enough terms to be able to have the kind of accuracy we want. Okay, now um, all this business that I am talking about here uh, basically gets sort of into the weeds on um, how we know that the limit as n approaches infinity, uh, this remainder here should go to zero. Um, we know that whatever the error is, it can't be smaller than zero. And we also know um, that it shouldn't be any larger than um, the n plus one of term. And of course the actual error, or in this case, the behavior of the error should be somewhere in between, okay? So uh, I mentioned saying, hey, we could actually use this setup here and prove that the limit of what you're seeing here or absolute value of it is going to go to zero um, using the squeeze theorem because of course we know this is equal to zero and if we are dealing with a power series that converges that the way it's supposed to this should be going to zero too okay and that's essentially all i'm saying here now the the quote-unquote hard part is how do i actually show the limit for the the upper bound Okay. Well, um, we can do that by doing such things as ratio test, root test. Um, if what this expression ends up looking like is a alternating series um, sequence, then sorry, alternating sequence, then uh, we could use alternating series test. Okay. But inevitably, the whole point here again is that if I have a power series that looks like this in general, and I know that this power series converges, 
then we know from studying series just in general, any power series, sorry, any series in general that converges, the limit of the sequence that the series is made from goes to zero as it approaches infinity here. And uh, this is, I call it basic fact number one in the videos I did for series. And that's basically what it says there. Okay. And so um, with that, we know that what we have here, this limit is going to eventually have to come to have to go to zero. Okay. Um, we can find various ways to do it, but at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen. All right. So in the part one uh, or video number one of this series, um, I went over this example and we wanted to figure out what the power series representation of uh, sine of X was centered at a equal to pi over two. And so I'm not going to go over this example again, but I'm introducing it to you because we are taking this particular example and we're going to apply uh, the Taylor remainder theorem and the Taylor's inequality theorem to this particular example. Okay? So uh, we see that we had this problem and here we figured out that uh, sine of X could be represented by this power series that you see here. So, um, of course, the summation from n equals zero to infinity of negative one raised to the n times x minus pi over two, um, all that raised to the n divided by two n factorial. Okay. So uh, now what we're going to do is see how we can apply what we know here, since we know the power series representation of this, we're going to apply those two theorems. So we're going to use the Taylor remainder theorem and the Taylor inequality theorem to show that the Taylor series for um, f of x is equal to sine x does indeed equal to sine of x for all real numbers. Okay, so we're going to use, uh, remember before what we did is we actually uh, showed what the convergence of it was. So we're going to use the Taylor remainder theorem and the Taylor inequality theorem to kind of show the same thing. Okay. So here, if we recall that the Taylor remainder theorem states that if we have the condition of, um, if we take the remainder of our Taylor series, so basically the n plus one if term all the way to the infinity term, if we take the limit of that as it approaches infinity and that goes to zero for the values of x that are within the integral of convergence, then we know that our function, in this case, sine of x, is equal to the sum of its Taylor series um, only on this interval here, which is basically going to be your interval of convergence, okay? And that's given that, of course, your function uh, sine of x can be written as a Taylor series where you can break it up into the first n terms and then, um, of course, the n plus one of terms after that, okay? So in general here, uh, we see that uh, this is what the nth degree Taylor polynomial would be, or the first n terms of the infinite polynomial series. And then, of course, r sub n is just going to be the remainder of it. So if we come here, um, f of x, I'm just going to write the first n terms of it, just exactly the way that I uh, defined it here. And notice here that I am um, using I as my counter um, instead of N here. Okay. So that was a, a switch that I made here. Um, and you'll see why it actually works out good to do it that way um, later on in the problem. So we have that. We know what R sub N is going to look like. It's just going to be sine of X, which is the actual function minus um, the first in terms of it. So here, according to the Taylor remainder theorem and recalling that um, our radius of convergence here was infinite in example three, we need to show that this R sub n of x is going to be equal to zero if we're going to prove um, that this particular power series indeed represents f of x for all values of x. Now, we don't have a nice clean way to express 
um, r sub n of x, you know, as a single term with some uh, finite value here. Okay, part of the reason for that, let's go back and look. If we look here, and I'll go ahead and circle this again. This is how we're currently expressing r sub n of x. And again, there's no way for us to take sine of x minus all of this and express it as a nice, clean um, polynomial representation for it. Okay. So uh, since we know that, we're going to look to Taylor's inequality theorem here to show us how to estimate an upper bound for this particular remainder. Okay. So according to Taylor's inequality theorem, we need to look at the inequality here, which is remember that um, the n plus one of derivative, um, and it has the absolute value of that has to be less than or equal to some um, value m for the essentially interval of convergence. And when we translated that, that just looked like what we had here. Okay, so all that stuff that I have written here. That's essentially what it looks like if we you know, make it look formal. So for example three, of course, our um, pi over two is what we centered the power series about. We know that the radius of convergence was infinite and our interval of convergence here uh, looks like this, even though it's still infinite. Okay. Now we also recall from example three that after evaluating the third derivative at pi over two, we found that the values of these derivatives started to repeat. Okay. And hence, um, you know, that's why we started to, uh, we only use the even terms of the power series because of that. Okay. And of course, we also know that um, we had an alternating thing going on, um, you know, in between negative one and one. Okay. For some of the derivatives as well. Okay. And Thus, just like how sine of x is, um, all of our values were essentially bouncing in between um, a negative one and a positive one. So that's what I'm stating here. Now, this will also hold true for the n plus one if derivative as well. Okay. So here we know that sine of the n plus one if derivative is going to have to be in between negative one and one which this is another way of saying that sine uh, raised uh, the n plus one, the derivative of sine absolute value of that is less than or equal to one, which now see if we, since we know that f of x is sine of x, that just looks like the n plus one, the derivative of some random function um, evaluated at pi over two. Um, we know that that be the case if f of x is sine x, okay? Now, this m that we were talking about here, since now we kind of got this um, looking something like the form that we want, in this case, compared to kind of what we have going on here, we're going to let m just equal one, okay? So if we let m equal one, which is what this is going to be, um, now we're going to say, um, that the absolute value of the remainder uh, should be no more than what we see here, okay? And we're going to uh, let this look like the, what well, we're going to let it serve as the upper bound for essentially this error here, okay? So, what we did here using this inequality theorem, um, Taylor's inequality theorem, is basically find an upper bound for what r sub n of x should be, okay? And so we see here that this is just going to look like our um, upper bound for it. And this should say this factorial, by the way. All right, so now we're actually going to use the Taylor remainder theorem to show that the limit of whatever this is should go to zero by using the squeeze theorem, okay? Now, again, the idea is this. 
we don't know exactly what r sub n of x is, but we know that however this behaves, it should behave it should behave just like what we have here. Okay, and what we're really trying to do is figure out well what is going to be the error in what we have here. Okay, so whatever the error uh, we have here, the error of what this is should follow suit. Okay, so that's kind of the idea here. So um, if we employ the squeeze theorem, um, just note from common sense standpoint, uh, the behavior of the error at, at its lowest should be zero. Okay, so if we do the limit, ah, the pen messed up there, and it's messing up some more. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's messing up some more. So I'm going to pause the video, fix this, and then we'll um, continue. All right, so we know here um, the limit as n approaches zero. Let me try this one more time. <laughs> So on the low end, the behavior of the error should be going to zero. On the high end, what we're saying is that the behavior is going to look, the behavior of the error is going to look like this, okay? And that's what I would put here. And what we're really trying to figure out is what is the limit of the actual error. Okay. So here we know this has got to be zero. We know that the limit of the error can be no more than what this is going to be. So we take the limit of what we have here and uh, we hope that that goes to zero. Okay. So that's the idea. And so here, um, that's why I have zero here. We have our upper bound for what our error could be. And now we just need to show that whatever we have here, the limit of that as n approaches infinity is going to go to zero, okay? Now, to, to do this, um, another way of saying, hey, we wanna show the this limit here is going to zero, we could look at this uh, using the ratio test, um, we can determine if this corresponding series is convergent, okay? And if it is, uh, we know that anytime we have a series that is convergent, then that implies that a sub n is approaching zero as n is approaching infinity, or the limit of the sequence that makes up the series goes to zero as n approaches infinity here, okay? So, again, we are trying to figure out, because I, I keep going back to make sure that everyone's following me here. We are trying to figure out what this limit is, okay? In order to find out what that limit is, we know that it can't be any more than what this limit is, okay? And here we know that if we look at what's on the inside of this, and we say, all right, well, let's make a series out of this thing that looks like a sequence, okay? That's what this is. Now that I have this expression that represents my upper bound, which is another way of saying it, the most amount of error that I could have, um, if I list out the first n terms of the Taylor series and I want to figure out, well, how much am I off? Well, what this looks like inside of this limit here is going to be the most that I can be for a particular x value that's in the interval of convergence of the power series. Okay, and if I look at this and say, all right, well, let's figure out if this particular series um, is convergent or not. Now that I'm looking at it as a series, now I'm opened up to tests such as ratio tests, root tests, alternating series tests, 
so on and so forth. And of course, the easiest one to use is going to be uh, the ratio test. That's kind of the, the first go to. Okay. So if I use the ratio test and show that this particular series here is convergent, then again, uh, by the basic fact that anytime we have a series that converges, what we also know is that the corresponding sequence, the limit of that goes to zero as n approaches infinity, okay? So we're going to leverage what we know about the ratio test to basically show that this particular um, series is going to converge. And then if we know that that converges, then we know that the limit of what was inside of that series has to go to zero, okay? And so um, once we actually show that, then what we'll show here is that not only is this limit zero, but this limit is zero, which is going to force this to also be zero, okay? So that's uh, the, the strategy here, okay? So we're looking at this series and um, we're going to figure out what is a sub n, which is just what's on the inside of here in the first place, and then a sub n plus one, everywhere where I see n, I replace it with n plus one. So I do that, do the ratio, absolute value. And of course, you can see here, um, doing a lot of stuff, end up with this particular expression, okay? So from here, take the limit as n approaches zero of that, which means I'm gonna take the limit as n approaches zero of this. Since the limit operator has n as its variable, it's not going to understand um, absolute value of uh, x minus pi over two, so I can factor that out. What's left here is just one divided by n plus two. Of course, the limit of that goes to zero. Zero times this anything here is zero. So uh, what we see here is that using the ratio test, we get an outcome of zero, which is less than one, which shows us that, hey, this particular um, series here is going to converge for any value of x that we want, okay? Hence, we know this series is a convergent series, so therefore the sequence that made up the series has, uh, has to have a limit that goes to zero as it approaches infinity, okay? So once we have that, then we know that whatever the remainder here is, I can also call it the error, whatever this is, we know it's gotta be in between zero and this upper bound. And when we do the limit of the lower and upper bound, we see that the limits for both of these is zero. So that means that the limit of what's in the middle here also has to be zero as well uh, via the squeeze thing, okay? And so we've actually uh, shown that the limit of the remainder here, even though we didn't know exactly what it was, um, as it approaches infinity, does go to zero. Now, because of that, um, we know that it follows that our function sine of x can be represented as this power series uh, for all values of x per the Taylor remainder theorem, because um, we have shown that the limit of the remainder part is equal to zero. And we know that the x values that we can do that for is going to be any real number. Okay, so uh, this concludes this video on actually showing how do we apply the, uh, the Taylor inequality theorem and the Taylor remainder theorem to show that a particular power series um, will match up with the function that it's trying to represent exactly over a range of x values. So in the part three video, um, what we're going to do in that one is do some more examples where um, we're going to be, first of all, looking at a list of McLaurin series.
So you actually have seen uh, through some of the examples that we did in the part one video, how we form these Taylor series um, or McLaurin series when we let the Taylor series be centered about zero. So we've seen that. So we're just going to get a list of them. And then afterwards, we're going to use that list uh, to help us do more problems. So I hope to see you in that video. Take care.